of people have read or heard about residential schools, but to walk the steps of what a young child did years ago, a completely different story. I had um, the honor and the privilege to actually be one of the very first media to walk through a building called the Mohawk Institute Residential School. It's in Brantford, Ontario, so it's about an hour and a half outside of Toronto for those who are not familiar. Uh, and it is very much eye-opening, you know, that this happened in your own backyard, where, wherever you are in Canada. These facilities existed. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it really... It really touched me, and I would say it, our, our cameraman as well. It was just to, to see it, to feel it, to touch it. Um, but I do want to make sure to our viewers who are about to see this that some of these stories and images you are about to hear and see, they are graphic in nature and they may be disturbing. Every element of this tells a story and tells a truth. Each room, each wall, each door, holding within it decades of pain and suffering. This is the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Ontario, one of only two residential schools that still exists in the province. Other such buildings torn down or converted. But here, the hope is to preserve, understand and learn. Our guide, Carly Gallant Jenkins, speaks of its history. Established in 1831, children from Six Nations brought here to assimilate with the goal of eliminating indigenous cultures and language away from their parents. We are standing currently in the boys' side of the building's playroom. And what would happen in this building? Boys would actually uh, create a little boxing ring out of these four pillars. So they would put little notches in those sides, which you can see still, and they would create that, uh, uh, use a rope and create a boxing ring, and they'd fight. Um, so it was very much like a prison mentality. Steps away, we walk through what is known as the fight hallway. There was a door on the one end with a window, and on this other end there was another door with another window. And the teachers or the faculty who worked here would uh, actually pull the um, they pull boys out of the out of their beds at night, and they'd bring them down here, and they would make them fight, and they would watch through these little windows, and then the boy that lost would have to clean it up afterwards, and then the boy who won would get perks throughout the week, might get a little extra food, might not have to do so much work, um, and that was just for staff entertainment. How old are the boys that are taking part in all of this at this point? So boys would come here, um, we've had records as young as three years old um, here. So, you know, they were learning to fight their, almost their entire childhood. Carly points out many parts of the building that they have been able to preserve. We stop here. This would have been one of the doors for the, uh, for the boiler room. So unfortunately, those um, loud rooms, um, they would uh, be where a lot of the abuses took place, a lot of the physical and sexual abuse, because it was loud. It was able to, those atrocities were able to take place there without knowledge. No one would hear. No one would hear. So we had girls, um, one of their roles was to do the laundry for the whole, all the other students and the surrounding community. So they actually got hired out um, from the school to do the, the community's laundry. So the, the school is profiting off of their labor. So this is another room where a lot of uh, physical and sexual abuse took place because it was able to be disguised by the, the, the volume of the machines. We walk into the old cafeteria, a gathering space where siblings would be able to catch a glimpse of one another, separated by gender and number. So they did do their best to try and separate family units within this space. So that they couldn't communicate. Correct. Yeah. In 1970, the Mohawk Institute closed its doors, reopening two years later as the Woodland Cultural Center, deemed a local historic site so that decisions would remain within the hands of the community. The center designed to promote First Nations culture and heritage, but a major flood in 2013 caused severe damage to the building, the community voting to rebuild. When you hear about the restoration and the preservation of a residential school, some might say, why would you want to do that? If this is a pile of rubble with a plaque in front of it saying what it was, it's not the same as actually walking through these hallways and standing where these children stood. The Save the Evidence campaign costing millions of dollars. The goal was for the building to open its doors again in 2020, but fundraising efforts hampered because of the COVID-19 pandemic. With hundreds of thousands more to raise, organizers are now hoping for a 2022 opening. I think I want people personally to be left with the resilience to see what happened to our people and our youth and our these children, you know, and seeing where our communities are all today.
It is unimaginable. Uh, it is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like to walk through that building? It's, uh, you know, hard to describe. A flood of emotions as you walk from room to room and hear the stories. You can't help think about, you know, this is what they went through every single day and, and couldn't speak out. And if you did speak out, you were disciplined. Um, it was unimaginable, unimaginable horrors. Um, but uh, I should mention, though, that this fundraising effort, the Save the Evidence campaign, and what you heard her say there, um, Carly, was if it was just a plaque, it's very different. They want people to walk through. They want people to learn. And with that, they are offering virtual tours. There is a small fee associated with it, I should mention, but all of that money is going back toward the fundraising efforts to reopen. Um, I'll put that website up for you. It's woodlandculturalcenter.ca. 